Hey everybody, welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. Thank you very much for being here. I'm going to do my best to keep these intros brief moving forward and get you right into the goods. Today we're going to interview Dr. Greg Wells, who is a Olympic athlete, expert on breathing, his PhD and uh, master's are both in physiology and respiratory physiology. And he focuses on improving breath for elite performance in athletes. Uh, he's done some really interesting research on sensitivity to carbon dioxide. So you guys know that I've been uh, very much focused on all those fringe factors of improving performance. Uh, and CO2 is a massive one. He also talks to us about HRV rest and uh, how to refocus and recharge. It's an amazing book. Today's podcast is brought to you guys by... By optimizers, you are not what you eat, you are what you digest. You guys know I've said that a thousand times, you've heard me say it. And as we age, we begin to lose enzymes. So if you don't get enough enzymes, you're likely absorbing a significantly lower percentage of the protein than you think you are. And it's just such a waste. I know I'm investing so much of my money and time finding the best quality ingredients in the country, uh, maybe even around the world at times. But I realize that my body's ability to absorb that is only as good as my digestion and my ability to break down nutrients. I've seen a lot of um, blood labs lately with people who are very deficient in minerals. And it's very interesting to explore why people become deficient in minerals. And, and maybe it's even deficient in some amino acids. Uh, the inability to break things down as we age is a really, really ish interesting problem. So um, Masszymes is able to break down the protein you eat uh, into usable amino acids, uh, which obviously is going to boost your absorption, uh, which means faster recovery, more energy, less inflammation, and ultimately better gut health. Um, you can use the code MUSCLE10 at masszymes.com, M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash muscle, M-U-S-C-L-E-1-0. Remember the code muscle10. Uh, huge fan of Bioptimizer. I've been using this product for a long time. And anytime I have a protein containing meal, I'm just throwing down at least two to four mass zymes. So without further ado, I hope you love this podcast with Dr. Greg Wells. And if you do, listen right through the end. We've got some really great info coming at you toward the end of that podcast. Dr. Greg Wells, thank you very much for joining me today, the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, man. You're doing some incredible stuff. So since our connection, uh, as you said, way back in March, I've been doing quite a bit of digging and gosh, you're living this incredible life. Uh, someone who just seems to be a high performer in all areas. And I'd love to dig into, first of all, telling your audience about who you are and where you, where you got your start, because you've got a really interesting background and something that, I don't know if you've heard any of my stuff lately, but like probably my greatest area of fascination lately is understanding uh, breathing and stress physiology and how we can ultimately hack that. And I think it may be the greatest missing link that nobody, well, not, not enough people are talking about. And, you know, I speak with a lot of high level athletes and high level, level performance and nobody knows what the heck it is. So you actually did your PhD in that. I did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in this really weird way. So I was a competitive swimmer growing up uh, and I used to, it's funny because I used to joke, like I did backstroke and people like, why are you a backstroke? I was like, because I can breathe whenever I want. And uh, then there was all these changes that happened in the late 80s in swimming where you were allowed to do backstroke underwater. It was actually faster to kick only underwater than it was to swim on the surface. So I learned how to hold my breath and became sort of fascinated with that. Um, also broke my neck when I was a teenager. So I uh, came back from like a neurological um, injury and uh, recovered fully. I went, you know, went back to competitive swimming all through university where I took kinesiology. Uh, and then after that, ended up doing a master's PhD, and uh, did you get to I, just, I went to the University of Toronto. So okay. I went to uh, my undergrad was in Calgary because there was a really great swim team there at the time, where I wanted to go swim. And then I came back, worked for a couple of years as a consultant, uh, and then went back to school, did a master's and PhD in physiology, and the PhD was on respiratory physiology because I wanted to understand control of breathing. So I studied in elite athletes how you could use. Uh, improve breathing to improve athletic performance. And what we looked at was what, so for example, in rowing, you have to breathe in time with the stroke. Right. And you can't allow, so you can't be breathing out of time with the stroke. You got to inhale and exhale as the paddle moves through the water or else everything gets out of sync and you can't do the sport. It's the same in swimming. You have to breathe in time with the stroke. To some extent, it's true with running. And those are all uh, entrained sports. So where breathing and movement are linked together. So I studied those. And what I tried to do is to figure out how we could decrease our sensitivity to carbon dioxide, which is what drives breathing. So a lot of people think that we breathe because 
uh, we need oxygen, and of course you do, but what makes you breathe harder or easier is actually CO2. And as you bur burn uh, energy in your muscles, you produce carbon dioxide, and you need to get that out of your body. That's why you breathe hard when you're exercising is to get rid of CO2, just like exhaust out of a car. And so my goal in my PhD work was to figure out how do we make people less sensitive to CO2 so that we can allow the technique to drive the movement, not breathing to drive the movement. You don't want anyone to rush to the next stroke, for example. And so we right. did all that work in swimming. And uh, then afterwards I went and did a, a postdoc at Sick Kids Hospital where I ended up working with kids with cystic fibrosis, CF being a lung disease. And we basically took everything that we learned in sports and applied it at the other end of the spectrum to kids who are struggling with, uh, with CF and ultimately leukemia as well and cancer. Um, so we basically built this exercise medicine program uh, while also working with elite athletes. So I kind of, my, the joke was it's a very balanced life, but I worked with uh, athletes who were trying to win medals at the Olympics or kids who were trying not to die. And that was the balance between those two extremes, doing the exact same thing in both groups. Yeah, it's incredible because, I mean, the levels of implication of the breath are, I think it's endless, right? And people don't always recognize that. And, you know, most of the times when people walk into my world now, that's the first thing I'm looking at. And that's not just from a, a biochemical perspective, but also from a biomechanical perspective. So I'd love to hear, even before we dive into, you know, the, all the cool stuff you're doing, is during your master's, uh, you said you studied a lot about CO2 tolerance and improving that within swimmers. Um, love to talk about, you know, what it looked like to, to you know, train and improve CO2 tolerance. And if you have a specific protocol or strategy you like to use. Yeah. So with the the masters was sort of the beginning of it. And so we looked just at swimmers and what we tracked was what we began to figure out is how do we evaluate CO2 sensitivity? And so what we did was we brought people into the lab, swimmers into the lab and hooked them up to a big machine and they breathed in and out of a, a device that we constructed. Um, and we would gradually um, bleed in a little bit of CO2. And so we kept their oxygen levels constant. And so O2 stayed the same, but we gradually increased CO2 uh, from very low levels to very high levels. So we'd hyperventilate, they'd blow up all their CO2, then they'd just simply uh, rebreathe and and we'd ramp up their CO2 in a linear way. So it was sort of like uh, very, very controlled. And then we would track their breathing. And what we discovered was that over the course of a season, as the athletes got into better and better shape, the curve, the CO2 sensitivity curve, shifted to the right, which means that you would breathe uh, less for a given amount of CO2 as you got fitter and fitter. So we proved that CO2 uh, was CO2 sensitivity was trainable. That was highly debated in the research up until that point. So what year that was, was that? That was in, gosh, when was I doing that? Late 90s was that research. Sort of 96, 97, 98 was all that that phase. Um, and then in the PhD, what we did was we deliberately tried to train it. And so we would do breath control work and also respiratory muscle training. So that's when all of the breathing devices came out where you'd breathe in and out of, uh, you'd either hyperventilate um, with a device, I think it was called the Spyro Tiger, uh, which was one device that was hot at the time. And then we used something called a power lung. And that was an inspiratory muscle and expiratory muscle trainer. Uh, there was also power breathe that came out in around that time with Alison McConnell out in the UK. So a number of different devices. I used the power lung because I wanted to be able to train both inspiration and expiration. So it's two different sets of muscles. Mm. You use some, you use mus some muscles to breathe in other muscles to exhale. The argument in the research at the time was that your muscles of expiration are passive. You just relax and air leaves your lungs. I thought that that probably wasn't true because when you're working at a high level, I think expiration is actually active. You're actively trying to get air out so you can get to the next breath more quickly. So I chose to do both and we demonstrated that you can improve your uh, lung muscle function. And so not lung muscle function, but your breathing muscles. That's the muscles in your rib cage, your diaphragm, the muscles all through your neck, uh, all of which we use to, we use to breathe. And what we discovered uh, along with some other people in uh, Wisconsin was that there's this thing called the muscle sympathetic nerve activation hypothesis, which is, you don't need MSNA hypothesis. And basically what that means is the harder your muscles of breathing work, the more blood they steal from your arms and legs. So the limiting factor in exercise is breathing. And so you probably all felt that, like you're going along, and then as soon as your breath gets out of control, your legs start hurting and lactate starts being produced. And that's literally exactly what happens. And I think it's a bit of a control mechanism to keep you from getting yourself to the point where you wouldn't be able to breathe. So the brain and body will always protect itself. And one of the ways I think that it protects itself is by regulating breathing to keep the breathing muscles 
healthy and functioning with blood and oxygen at the expense of everything else, your arms and your legs. So that was, that was the PhD research. Did you see a point of diminishing returns to where someone hit like a, a threshold of CO2 tolerance and going anywhere above that was either unreachable or no longer seeing a benefit? Uh, that's an interesting question. We only, so on the, um, the year that we tracked the kids, uh, swimmers, and we evaluated their CO2 sensitivity, we saw that shift, that curve shift throughout the course of the season. And that was sort of from um, like an October through March, April time zone. So, you know, five, six months, it continued to improve. We never really saw a plateau. Um, and then during the PhD research, we only did training blocks of six weeks. And so during that six week period, we again saw the shift in the CO2 curve in the athletes that we were looking at in addition to the respiratory muscle training work. So I don't know if we ever got to a plateau on that one, but our oh, time frames were relatively short. Were you um, quantifying with like a capnography machine and just looking at how much, what their CO2 tolerance was? Exactly. Yeah. So we basically built a, a system in the lab where they would come in, um, they would breathe in and out of a plastic bag. We would bleed oxygen into the plastic bag to make sure that O2 stayed the same. And then as they exhaled CO2 into the bag, it would increase in a very linear fashion um, according to your metabolism. So your metabolic rate would just add that much every single breath to, to the bag. Uh, and that would take CO2 from very low to very high. So straight line in terms of the CO2 that you're breathing in and the ventilatory response shifted um, down basically. And so we downregulated our response as you get fitter, you can tolerate more CO2. Is that also how you trained it by bleeding in the oxygen, having them wear the, the rebreathing bag or did you guys do other specific things? Yeah. In swimming, what we did was a number of uh, sets. The nice thing about swimming is you can just stop people from breathing. You just ask them to put their face in the water and they can't breathe. And so the coaches that I was working with, we did things like uh, breathing every three strokes, every five strokes, every seven strokes, every nine strokes, just to increase their capacity to tolerate longer periods of time without a breath. Therefore, their CO2 would go up. You have to be super careful when you do that, though, because you don't want O2 to drop to the point where you pass out. That's why there's things like shallow water blackouts where people hyperventilate and then see how long they can hold their breath underwater and you pass out. Um, because oxygen will drop faster than CO2 will rise. And remember the drive to breathe is from CO2, not oxygen. So you'll have, you will be sitting on the bottom of the pool with no urge to breathe whatsoever. And if your oxygen drops enough, you'll just simply black out yeah. and, you, and then you drown. So we wanted, we wanted to avoid that. So we were very careful about how we did it. We did a lot of breathing pattern work. And then the interesting thing we did was we went also, once they could tolerate the three, five, seven, nine breathing patterns, we would then put on paddles. So when you put on paddles on a swimmer, basically it's an extra piece of plastic that goes over the hand to increase the surface area, which is like strength training, sort of like lifting weights as you swim. It makes you super strong, but it also slows down your stroke. So in rowing, it would be like going from having a small paddle to having a huge paddle. And you can imagine if you have a small paddle, the turnover is high. If you have a big paddle, the turnover is low. So when we slowed down their turnover even further with the paddles and then did the breathing pattern work again, we could extend it further. And so what we were training was distance per breath. We wanted them to be able to travel a further distance in between breaths so that they could hold their technique for longer without becoming disrupted. So that's what we did. And that's how we, how we trained it. Did you see a corresponding increase in their performance? So did that team succeed that year? I'd love to hear how that looked. Yeah, there's really interesting improvements in that group. And we, I, I had the best groups, the best athletes in the area from four different clubs that participated. So they were already very good. And, um, they did really well. And we obviously had a control group that didn't improve. And the way that we did it was um, we had a, a baseline period of six weeks where all the athletes did the same thing. Then we split the athletes into two groups, control and experimental, tracked the improvement, saw the improvement in the experimental group. Then we swapped them. And so when we swapped them and the experimental group did nothing and the, um, the previous control group started the intervention, uh, the control group Got the got the benefits as well, so we were able to see that when we withdrew the interventions, it didn't progress. When we added the interventions back, and in, it did, and so that was a really interesting research design that we used back at the time. I actually, haven't used that since. So I should probably do that at some point with another study, but that's what we did with that group. So effectively, uh, for the listeners at home who aren't swimmers, it's like just an extended breath hold, right? So while you're exercising, something that seems to be relatively rhythmic or maybe not massive high intensity, just doing something that's intentionally uh, increasing breath holds. Is there a number of repetitions that you suggest or amount of du a duration of time to see the greatest adaptation? Is it long or short? Yeah, what I would say to people is like, you could even just experiment with it. And all that we really would, would ask everyone listening to do is to bring their attention to their breath. 
and understand that breathing does impact your performance regardless of what you're doing, whether it's walking up the stairs, um, public speaking, like right now I'm trying hard to you know, take a good breath in between every single sentence that I say. So I'm not talking, you know, from the top of my lungs right now. And obviously when you're doing weight training, breathing is incredibly important. You know, exhale on the contraction, inhale as you, as you lengthen the muscles. And we know that if you take that to the extreme and look at tennis players, for example, and they, you hear them screaming as they hit the ball, that's an explosive exhale in time with contraction that activates the region in their brain that's associated with stress to increase your muscular power. And that links all happen through the medulla and the brainstem. And we know that, that that works quite powerfully. So if you take it from like the wild extreme to an explosive scream during a tennis uh, shot, all the way down to deep, relaxing breathing during meditation, you can see that there's a wide spectrum through which humans can function and use their breathing to help them accomplish whatever their task is, right from being as relaxed as you can possibly be without falling asleep you know, all the way through to the most explosive movements that humans are are capable of. So when it comes to us training that, the first step is really just bring your awareness to your breath. So let's say you go for a walk this afternoon, you know, as you're walking, just pay, pay attention to your breath and notice how your breathing eventually, you know, aligns to the pattern of your movements. And then maybe just experiment with holding your breath for five, for five seconds as you walk. I was about to say five minutes, for five seconds as you walk. And and just see what that does and then allow yourself to recover. And then maybe if you're going up a hill, hold your breath for a few seconds and see how that feels. Uh, and if you're running, same thing. If there's any runners in your audience, that's a really good one. You just do 10 second breath holds in the middle of your run and that will really mess you up. Like it hurts, like it's super uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable psychologically as well. In fact, there's a link between increased CO2 levels and panic attacks. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very, very careful when we do this as well because there's a huge psychological component to it. Um, so, and that's just something that we do all the time. Whenever I've trained any athletes right through from kayakers through to rhythmic gymnastics, through to archery, through to, um, through to swimming, we're always thinking at some time, not all the time, but there's an awareness of, of breath training that goes into it to make sure that the athletes are at least under control and aware of it. And if there's a limitation that we work on it to eliminate that, that limitation. Yeah, Dr. Feinstein's got some really interesting stuff recently. I don't know if you've checked out his stuff with respect to CO2 and panic attacks. But one one quick thought or or maybe uh, inquiry as far as um, respiratory physiology, uh, acute adaptations. So I'm going into the gym and I want to potentially improve my acute CO2 tolerance. Is it something that we can do in, in a short amount of time and still see that short-term adaptation? Or is it more of something that I need to do kind of chronically and repetitively to see uh, any type of benefit? Um, I would submit that it's probably chronic and repetitive. So unlike strength training, where we know that when you get into the gym, the first three to six weeks is largely neurological adaptations. It's your nervous system learning how to move and how to recruit muscle tissue. Then after you're good at recruiting the muscle tissue, then you can start to have um, hypertrophy and your muscles will start to grow because they're being activated sufficiently. I think with this, it's a little bit different in that it's very purely physiological. Like what we're literally doing if I can explain the physiology of it, it'll probably help everyone understand. So you produce uh, carbon dioxide in your organs, your brain, and your muscles. That CO2 leaves the tissues and goes into your blood. That blood returns to your lungs and you exhale the CO2. The blood then gets reoxygenated. And as it leaves the lungs through the aorta, there's these little uh, nerves called peripheral chemoreceptors that taste the blood coming out of your lungs that's about to go to the body. And they taste it for acids like hydrogen ions and CO2. And if there's any deviation in your CO2 levels, those peripheral chemo reflexes will activate a sensor in your brain that makes you breathe harder. There's central chemo chemo receptors as well in your brain. So if your brain notices that uh, the tissues of your brain start to increase their CO2 levels, that's like the emergency. That's when you really start to, heart, start to hyperventilate. So you have your peripheral ones for the blood, central ones for your brain, they monitor your CO2 levels. If your CO2 levels go anything beyond resting base levels, they make you hyperventilate so you can blow off that CO2 as fast as possible. It's how the body stays in what's called homeostasis and how we sort of um, regulate our physiology to keep it from becoming too acidic or too basic. Um, and that, that's actually as a side note why, you know, um, alkaline forming foods is really is a ridiculous concept. I think they're healthy for you. I think they do wonderful things for you, but they don't chase, change the acid base balance of your body. That's controlled by breathing in your, in your chemoreflexes, very tightly regulated. 
if over an extended period of time, you repeatedly expose yourself to high CO2 levels in the context of exercise, we found that the peripheral chemo reflexes slowly desensitize. We weren't able to see that in the central chemo reflexes because there's two different curves that we that we look at there. Um, but we found that you can slowly desensitize your peripheral chemo reflexes so they become less responsive to changes in CO2, but that takes weeks and a lot of training um, over an extended period of time. So I don't think that's an acute thing. I definitely think it's a chronic thing. It's um, how that, you know, what that adaptation looks like physiologically, not sure. Um, but yeah, that's what we, that's what we found. Any, is there any truth to the suggestion that uh, extended breath holds or at least strong breath holds, something where, you know, you're ultimately going to gasp for air may cause some contraction of the spleen to release more red blood cells to improve oxygen carrying capacity? I have not heard that. Um, that's really interesting. I have not heard that at all. The, so you know who Patrick it, McEwen is, the oxygen advantage guy? Oh, no, I haven't heard that. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, so Patrick McEwen's the guy who's the, the creator of the oxygen advantage, and he's, okay. that's one thing he suggested to us, is like doing three to five uh, extended breath holds before a training bout will release more red blood cells, improve oxygen carrying capacity, and your body will recycle them once they're gone. Hmm. Interesting. Um, have not seen that. Um, definitely something I'll look af up after. I'm not saying like, I'm not saying no. I'm just saying like, don't know. It's yeah. a possibility. Um, have not, have not heard that one. Um, so yeah, I think that basically with all of this, what we're really seeing as true with sort of every, every bit of physiology is that we really do need to be consistent. And that goes with regards to muscle strength development, with regards to speed development, with regards to breath hold ability. Um, yeah, the consistent, the consistent practice is what leads to positive adaptations over an extended period of time. The repeated breath holds is an interesting idea. I think that there's a definite psychological training that can happen when you do that, because what happens as CO2 builds up is that, and this is a really interesting sort of idea. Again, it's super dangerous to hold your breath. So like, I'm just putting that out there yet again, every time that I say it, just to make sure that we're all being safe. But um, so let's say that you're, you just pause and, and you hold your breath for as long as you can under normal circumstances. That's anywhere from like 40 seconds to 90 seconds for a typical human. And at some point you take that breath. So as CO2 builds up, you're going to start feeling the urge to breathe. That feeling of the urge to breathe comes from your CO2 activating those peripheral chemoreceptors and firing information into your brain and your brain sending signals down through the spinal cord to your diaphragm, to your respiratory muscles to contract. And what you're doing psychologically is saying, don't contract, don't contract, don't contract, don't contract, don't breathe, don't breathe, don't breathe. And at some point your physiology overwhelms your psychology and you take the breath. So that's a really, really interesting point because your mind is battling your body and you can learn so much about your internal psychology and your thought process processes in like the 10 seconds before you take the breath and the 10 seconds after that you take that breath, because that's the mind body war that is happening and your body will always win. So like it, your body will win. So at some point your brain will give up and your body will overwhelm it because survival takes precedence. So, um, yeah, that's a really interesting, um, thing to explore. And again, be super safe. Don't hyperventilate before you do it. Don't do it near water. Um, don't do it where you can pass out, fall down and hurt yourself. Like, you know, so just be careful with it and uh, just explore that breath hold idea and the psychology that happens in and around when you do actually take that breath. Do you tend to suggest wearing the pulse ox for people who are playing with this stuff? Um, yes, I think that that will help. However, I mean, the reality is that if you hold your breath for 60 seconds, um, your pulse ox symmetry isn't really going to go down that much. If it's a, if, if for both you and I sitting here right now, we're probably 98, 99, 100% saturated with oxygen anyway. Um, it's extremely difficult to bring that level down, especially at sea level. Um, I've gotten mine down to 65%, but I was also at 20,000 feet on a volcano in Ecuador, like in the middle of the night in a snowstorm. Um, and that was extraordinarily uncomfortable, but normally like 85% you get sent to the hospital. And so if you're, if you're, if you're holding your breath long enough to start seeing a change and a drop in your oxygen saturation, like 97%, 98%, uh, sorry, 98, 97, 96%, that's a point where your CO2 is probably high enough to force you to start breathing again. And again, O2 is not really a factor here. Um, 
oxygen increases your sensitivity, but it's sort of a modifier, not a driver. So when it comes to breath hold and psychology, we're not really interested in, in pulse oxygen oximetry. I actually haven't, we thought about using pulse oximetry a little bit in some high performance sport training, but we found that heart rate was a much more sensitive um, indicator of aerobic stress. Lack, blood lactates were uh, much more indicative of anaerobic stress. And we really only saw desaturation in really highly trained athletes under extraordinarily difficult um, training circumstances, like four minutes all out VO2 max and a highly trained athlete that can hold their anaerobic capacity up for two minutes as they're training at that level. And there's like 20 people in the world that can do that. So it was never really a, a factor for us. Um, although we did use it and still do use um, oximetry in the lab at sick kids that does exercise training, sorry, exercise testing. Cause we test kids with CF and heart disease and a number of other conditions. Um, and there it's incredibly important because if a child with a chronic illness starts to desaturate, then the test is over basically like almost instantaneously. So, um, yeah, we never really used it that, that much just cause it's such a, a high threshold to achieve where we would actually begin to see some real changes in that. And it also, that typically happens after some of the earlier changes that we can de detect using other technologies. So you said, speaking about, um, high performance training like what are you doing what are you doing to get on top of a mountain let's talk about that what are you doing <laughs> you know uh, but you say you're working with a lot of high level athletes and a lot of my audience is high level athletes and we're like okay what are, what are the most practical ways for me to get and sustain a high co2 tolerance what are me what are my Got best it. ways to get and sustain high aerobic thresholds like push my vo2 um you know all of those kind of uh, ideal training circumstances you know for me personally i've kind of come into this place in my life where I finally have a bit of a new direction with where I want to go after being a professional bodybuilder. And I really want to see what I can do uh, aerobically. Like, I, and then not necessarily, you know, doing hundred milers or anything crazy like that, but like, you know, climbing mountains sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. Doing, doing really long duration uh, exercise, but as high as intensity as I can sustain over long period of time. Like you say, becoming one of those 20 people who can sustain that VO2 for that uncomfortable period of time. Cause that, that's interesting to me. So, you know, those are the people that are the tip of the spear that are ultimately challenging the paradigm that are creating the new paradigms. And that sounds like something you're tapping into. Right. Um, I do love spending time in that, that space. Uh, I love spending time with athletes that are trying to push the limits in that, that area. I'm working with far fewer athletes now than I have historically. Um, in my, my life, I've sort of gone from 25 years working with the Olympic team, uh, and you know, PGA tour players in golf and a couple pro baseball players and now sort of gradually transitioning to trying to increase my impact broadly to thousands and, and millions of people uh, just because I feel like that's the phase of life that I'm in at the moment now is my knowledge dissemination time uh, where, I, where I really want to share things through books and podcasts, which is why we're doing this interview here today. I just want to help as many people as possible. So when it comes to truly world-class performance and training to achieve, you know, that world-class performance, and by the way, for everyone listening, like world-class performance for me is like you just reaching your potential, whatever that happens to be. So I, I've always said um, the, one of the most amazing athletic performances that I've ever seen, I've worked with 200 Olympic athletes, you know, a dozen PGA Tour players, you know, multiple pro level athletes in the four major, major leagues in North America, been to three Olympic games um, with television. And the greatest single athletic performance I've ever seen in my entire life was when I was in the cancer ward at SickKids and a child with leukemia who was getting chemotherapy got up, got up off the bed by herself, walked to the washroom, which was 10 feet away, closed door, used the washroom and returned to her bed all on her own. Like that intensity, that effort, that difficulty, that psychological challenge, the, the work that that child did in that 10 minute period of, of time um, to achieve that was better than anything I've seen. That's better than Usain Bolt. That's better than Michael Phelps. Like that's just next level. So I don't care where you are on the spectrum. We're just simply looking to reach our potential at whatever it is that that happens to be. If it's bodybuilding, great. If it's climbing a volcano, fabulous. If it's going for a 5k walk in the neighborhood, neighborhood that's massive for 85% of the population that doesn't get any physical activity whatsoever. So we're just like constantly encouraging everyone to do just a little bit more regardless of where you are. And having worked at the, the extremes, like literally from Olympic champions and world record holders all the way down to the kid in the cancer ward that's trying to go to the bathroom, um, it's the same. 
it's incredible how the psychology is exactly the same. The physiology is exactly the same across that entire spectrum. Um, and that includes, you know, someone who's obese that decides that that's enough and they're going to get up off the couch and, and they're going to start going for a walk. Like that's also incredible. So when it comes to world-class training and reaching that world-class potential, some of the things that we consistently see, um, especially as you approach sort of, let's say top 20 in the world is that people go from thinking they know everything and they progress into realizing that they know absolutely nothing. And you can instantly identify someone that's a hundredth in the world from someone that's top 10 in the world, because the person who's top 10 in the world is asking questions. And the person that's hundredth in the world is telling everybody what they're doing. Yep. And so I encourage everyone to be like, just become a student. Don't randomly consume anything that you read on the internet. Cause obviously there's, you know, loads of blog posts and masquerading as science, but, um, just become a, pra a student of whatever it is that you care about the most. Like look at the greats, read about the greats, study the greats, be inspired by the greats, con connect with, with the great ones um, and watch very carefully what they do. And then read what their coaches are writing and study the books that their coaches have written. Um, look ag about what they're doing in the context of the historical work that has been done. Um, dig into the research studies. And at first it'll seem like another language completely but you know if you read five or six and you start to say oh, okay cool they're all structured this way we can begin to pull that out and what is consistent is the consistency so once you start to ask the questions then the great ones are also relentlessly consistent about what they're doing so they are the ones who have the protocols they're the ones who have the daily routines they are the ones that that use those daily routines to um, stop themselves from making decisions based upon how they feel and they make decisions about based upon what the plan is. And so if you feel a certain way, it doesn't dictate what the workout is. The workout is the workout. If you feel great, fantastic. If you don't feel good, you're still doing the workout. It's not really up for discussion. Um, and then you can modify further training based upon what happened. You can modify your recovery. And then the other really interesting thing that uh, we've seen is especially this wouldn't have been the case in the eighties and nineties, but is definitely the case now is the world-class performers are the ones whose lifestyles align with what they're trying to do. And it's a basically your 24 hour athlete. So it's your sleep, nutrition, stretching, massage, foam rolling, like all the modalities that you can use to help you reach what it is that you want to do. That then sets you up for being able to do the workouts, to do the training, to do the sets and uh, that, that you need to do to give you the capacity to achieve what it is that you want to achieve. And funny enough, as I've gotten, when I was a, a swimmer coming through, you know, all that stuff was done for me. I didn't think about it. So I just sort of did it and it sort of happened. And looking back, I'm like, yeah, I could have done better, but you know, it is what it is. You only know what you know. Um, now that I know so much and I've had so much experience um, and there's so many demands upon my time. Like I've got children, I've got, you know, a business to run. I've got a lab that I need to pay attention to. In addition to trying to get into shape, it becomes a little bit more difficult and a bit more of a juggling act. And that's, that's just life. So the other final piece of the puzzle I'll just throw out for everybody is this idea of radical acceptance, like you're doing the best you can. It is what it is. Life is what it is. You know, life is life. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. It's totally fine. It's just a process. We're all just trying to do a little bit better and, some days are great and other days are not going to be all that great. And so the ones who are able to continuously improve are generally the ones who stay relentlessly positive and are hyper accepting of themselves and use sports to sort of burn their demons that they can go through and, and reach whatever it is that they're trying to, to reach. So anyway, just probably not the answer you were looking for, but that's really what I've been seeing for a lot of people over the years. What percentage of the top athletes that you work with or across the world are actually using CO2 tolerance and heart rate variability and all these kind of metrics um, that you and I would know to be highly correlated with performance. How, how many of them are using it as kind of a, a continual metric to follow to gauge performance and recoverability? Interesting. I would say that there's very few people thinking deliberately about CO2 tolerance and breathing, which is still shocking to me. Like it's the most fundamental thing that humans do. Like we, if you stop breathing for three minutes, you die. You know, you can go days without water. You can go weeks without food. You don't breathe, you die. It's like, it's that important to us. And we know that breathing has a powerful impact upon our mental health, our mental well-being, our physical health and our physical well-being. And you could argue even maybe spiritually as well when it comes down to meditation and prayer and other things where if you're not breathing properly, it's impossible to, to do 
um, execute on those techniques. So yeah, it's it's definitely um, uh, not enough people are thinking thinking about breathing, um, and certainly not enough for thinking about CO two when it comes to uh, heart rate variability and heart rate tracking. That's a different story. I actually think that a lot of people are are looking into that. Um, I had an opportunity to work with Toronto's Major League Soccer team a few years ago, and their director of sports science, and uh, that was one of the variables that they began to look at to look at subject, um, sorry, participant player um, recovery and regeneration. In addition to some really cool big data analytics about how much you're running in practice, how much you're running in the games, like really using GPS to track the players as they play to get actual measurements of how fast they're going, like exactly what they're doing which revolutionized training to bring the training into alignment with the sport, which was super cool. But oh yeah, heart rate variability is a really interesting one. We're also now seeing how you can use heart rate variability to understand sleep cycles. So you can figure out whether you're in deep sleep, light sleep, or REM based upon your heart rate variability as you sleep with devices like the Oura Ring. Whoop is another one. And uh, my lab just put out a new app for Apple Watch. If anyone's got an Apple Watch called Vivio, V-I-I-V-I-O. And there's a a section of that called Think Clearly, where you can track your heart rate variability in 60 seconds using your Apple Watch. So that's a free app, by the way. So um, anyone feel free to download that. Uh, but yeah, heart rate variability is super interesting. What heart rate variability gives you is the balance between sympathetic nervous system activation, which is your stress system, it's your fight or flight system, and your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your recover and regenerate system. So as your parasympathetic dominance increases, your recovery and regeneration system becomes more active, your heart rate becomes more variable. So when you're stressed, your heart rate beats very rhythmically and their variability is zero. So like, you know, beat, 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 beat. And it's always exactly the same because the drive from the brain to your heart is so strong. Um, whereas when you're relaxed, the drive from the brain is variable. It's much lower. And so as a result, the heart beat changes. So it might be like beat, 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 beat right? So it's all over the place. And as that variability rises, uh, we can measure that using a heart rate monitor. And that gives us a very good indication of the stress of your nervous system. And that is a very powerful tool to understand your recovery and regeneration. We even think it might predict uh, illness two to three days out. So if you're fighting, a, fighting off a, an illness and you don't even know it yet, but your body's immune system is working hard, your nervous system will be stressed. And as a result, your heart rate variability will drop. And that's a good way for us to assess whether or not you're um, fighting so something off. You can also just do resting heart rate first thing in the morning when you wake up, before you get out of bed, before you sit up, take your heart rate for 60 seconds, track it, write it down, do that. And you'll very quickly figure out what your real resting heart rate is. And again, two to three days before you get sick, your heart rate will jump up three to five beats. And if you take it easy, if you relax, if you take the day off work, if you sleep, if you chill out, then all of a sudden you're gonna be able to actually prevent you yourself from getting sick in the first place. Um, and also be able to adapt your training so that you know that if you're not adapting well or you're overstressed, you're overtired, you can adapt your training accordingly. So, yeah. What do you think would be a better measure of performance, CO2 tolerance or HRV? Um, I think that HRV is a very good indicator of your uh, your nervous system status. So I would use um, HRV as an, an indicator of recovery and regeneration. And I would use CO2 tolerance for a better understanding of an athlete's aerobic to anaerobic, like high end aerobic and anaerobic uh, tolerance for sure. Amazing. So getting in your book, rest, refocus, recharge. I mean, when I, when I ripped through the table of contents, I was just like, thank you for writing this book. You're literally like going through things in my mind. And I'm like, this is the book that needs to be written. So super excited to dive into that with you. Uh, tell me what the inspiration of that was. You've got a number of books, but this is the most recent one. Yeah, sure. So the inspiration. So I wrote Super Bodies around the 2012 Olympics when I was commentating. That was just like a an, an encyclopedia of sports science knowledge. So if you've loved this conversation, like all that stuff is in in Super Bodies. But it's a very technical book. It's like an encyclopedia. It's a textbook. I thought it was a thought it wasn't, but it, it was. Um, and then I wrote the Ripple Effect, which was the other end of the spectrum, which is like nutrition, exercise, mindset, and sleep, the basics of human health. That one did incredibly well. But the question that came back from a lot of people who read the ripple effect was like, okay, this is all great, but how do I actually do it? And so rest or focus recharge was built around the idea of finding little blocks of time during the day when you can drop in these tactics to improve your life. So if you only have seconds to recover, what do you do? Breathe, <sighs> right? Just a few deep breaths. What's the benefit of that for your physiology? Okay, well, it settles your body, settles your mind. 
that's wonderful. If you have minutes to relax, what do you do? Well, stretching can shift you from sympathetic to parasympathetic. So that's a great opportunity for you to calm down your nervous system. If you have hours to recover, okay, well, then we can do a workout. Um, then we can do a sauna. Uh, then we can do a cold water immersion, all of which you know, are tools to recover and to regenerate. What if you have days? Oh, okay, well, then maybe you could actually take a vacation or unplug from your technology. And that's another thing that will ultimately lead you to uh, improve. So it's sort of like the application of all of the ideas that I've ever written in any of my other books um, uh, against a framework of like, how do we actually fit this into our life? And then if you do it, what's the benefit? Well, the cool thing is that as you start to focus on recovery and regeneration and rest, which is what athletes do, and you know, the successful athletes are the one who not necessarily train the best, but who recover the best that they can train better more often. Um, what we found was that if you downshift out of our regular busy hustle, 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 go, 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 do more psychology, uh, that we're able to learn better. So when you relax just a little bit and you get yourself out of a, what we call beta brainwave states, which is your brain is sizzling with stuff to do, um, you downshift just a little bit, you slow down your brain just a little bit, you end up in reflection and strategic thinking and learning. So just imagine sitting down to read a book, right? And you're learning something from that book. That's a very different state than when you're racing around, you know, trying to nail your to-do list, uh, cross items off your to-do list. If you settle down even further from the, like the reading and learning and strategic thinking and reflection mindset, you enter into what's called theta brainwave states. By the way, alpha is the learning, um, the learning states where a lot of people get to in meditation. If you go a little bit deeper than that, you end up in theta brainwave states, which is when you're creative and you problem solve and you ideate. And that's like daydreaming. And people think that sometimes when you're daydreaming, you know, you're wasting time or you're procrastinating. Well, actually, it's quite the opposite. We get our best ideas when we're daydreaming. We get our best ideas when we're ideating. We get our best ideas when we're sort of staring out at the ocean on vacation, watching the waves roll in. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, you know, maybe I could do that little differently next time. And so what I just wanted people to understand is by shifting their state, which I've heard you talk about a lot in your work, um, you know, especially in, in kids, we, when we change the state of the individual, you can change the outcome of whatever it is that they're trying to do. And I want people to feel like they're in control of their lives and that we get ourselves out of this state of hustle, 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 go, go, go craziness that was particularly evident right before COVID-19 hit actually. And I think that one of the, the side benefits of, and I don't want to say there's any benefits, this global pandemic where hundreds of thousands of people have died, you know, and it, it's tragic and at a massive scale all over the planet. Um, but it's incumbent upon us as humans to positively adapt to whatever situation that we're faced with. And I think that one of the things I would love for people to consider is how do we reimagine the future now that we're not commuting, you know, now that schools have been shut down, businesses have been shut down, like how do we reimagine the future to be better? How do we restart things in such a way that they were better than they were before, rather than just simply trying to return to normal and normal being a state when so many people are faced with burnout, with sleeplessness, with obesity, with anxiety, with depression, like, how do we do things differently? And I want us to do things differently by downshifting a little bit, taking the time for ourselves to recover and to regenerate so we can do what we love to do at a higher level. And that's the book. That's awesome. And so one of the previous guests on the podcast had said, maybe, just maybe, humanity manifested this because we needed to learn how to take a breath. And maybe the earth needed to be able to relax and reju rejuvenate itself because we know it can rejuvenate so quickly. Maybe it just needed a few months of us not, kind of beating it into the ground and beating ourselves into the ground. Again, that may be a stretch because I know a lot of people have lost their jobs and their lives, but like, hey, you know what? Maybe it's exactly what we needed as a race to take a step back and see what we actually value, see what's important to us, spend more time with family, spend more time ideating, as, as you will say, uh, and ultimately, you know, take charge and create this new life like you alluded to. So one of the chapters in your book that I want to, I don't want to gloss over is called Thinking About How You Think. Mm. And uh, geez, most people I don't even know whether that's possible. I've said that, I think, on the podcast before. People are like, what do you mean? Like, I have to think about how I think? I'm like, well, maybe. So talk to me about that. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's this idea of metacognition. So I've got this picture of my son, Adam. And Adam was maybe three years old when I took this picture. And the reason why I took the shot is because when we go down to the beach near my house, um, he'll go crazy for five minutes, run around, hit stuff with stuff, grab a stick, throw a rock. But then inevitably, after about three to five minutes of him burning energy, he will find a spot, go off by himself, and sit and stare out at the lake and i look at that i'm like oh you know that's kind of cool it's almost like he's just sort of meditating but he's very contemplative very reflective and i snap this picture and it's the cutest thing like this little three-year-old is basically sitting in lotus position staring out at the waves and 
and just sort of smiling to himself, right? And like, what a gift to be able to do that. And I was like, what's he doing when he's out there? And clearly he's just sort of like, he's just thinking. He's just sort of like staring at stuff. He's taking it all in. There's a lot going on in his brain. So it's kind of cool to see. And then as I began to dig into that and some other things, I found this idea of metacognition, which is thinking about how you think. And the easiest way for people to activate metacognition is that when you're about to start a task, when you're about to start a project, or let's say you're starting to train for something, it's just to pause, pull out a piece of paper and ask yourself three questions, write down the answers, which is what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? And how do you want to do it? And when we ask ourselves those three questions, what, why, and how, we pivot from execution, beta brainwave states, into reflection, strategic thinking, and metacognition, which is alpha brainwave states. We slow ourselves down, we pause, and then we can move forwards with intention. And the research in students who do that technique before they start studying for exams is that they, they are three to 5% better on the exam when they do that versus when they don't. Now that might not seem like very much, but three to 5% is sort of like half a grade point. And if you compound that, over time, repeatedly in everything that you do, we get these exponential improvements over time. And so if you do 1% better every single day for a year, for example, you'll be better by a factor of 37.78 by the end of the year. Like there's exponential gains when we do these sorts of things. Um, so I really encourage people to do the metacognition, like do the journaling, which is like having a conversation with yourself, spend time writing down what you're grateful for. Um, have the conversations with your loved ones and your partners, but like, how's life going? Like, how are we doing? How's our relationship? Um, how's our training? Talk to your coach about what's going on. Um, and when we take a step back to think, all of a sudden, so many other things become possible and the path forwards become so much more clear. And instead of just sort of racing around frantically, we can live a life with, with more purpose and more intention and that's where, where I think that all comes in. So yeah, think about how you think. It is totally possible. Meditation helps you learn how to do it better. And so does journaling. And so does gratitude journaling. And so does asking yourself those three questions, what, why, and how. It's a simple reality of like, if you built that in for five minutes every day, one, you become more reflective, but two, now you're anchoring that alpha state more often, right? Rather than kind of perpetually being in beta like everyone seems to be, the more often you can anchor those those micro increments to bring your brain back into alpha and theta, maybe eventually that becomes a state you can access at will rather than having to seek for it and, and struggle to find it. Like most people who say they can't meditate, but just maybe it doesn't have to start with meditation. Maybe it just has to start with some intentional practice to bring yourself into alpha and theta. 100%. And I know a lot of people struggle with meditation. I do too. And like I've traveled to India and spent time in the mountains trying to figure it out. So like I've actually invested in trying to figure it out and I still struggle with it. It's not easy. Um, but it, the funny thing about it not being easy is that it's actually the harder you try, the harder it becomes. Exactly. So literally it's just like stop trying and it's like, oh wait, there's meditation, yeah. which can also happen if you listen to a great piece of music, which can also happen if you go for a walk in a park without your phone, um, which can also happen if you stare into the eyes of your loved ones, or it can also happen if you're in the middle of a workout and you sort of enter into the zone and you just keep yeah. going, which is why I don't think anyone should have a device with them when they're in the gym. Like right. put away the devices. If you wanna to listen to music, that's fine. But like, don't check your email, don't send text messages when you're working out. Otherwise you miss out on all of the psychological benefits. And now that you're switching into more endurance world, one of the reasons why I love endurance activities is because when you're out there and you're out there for a long time and you start to get tired and you start to get sore and you've gotta keep going, there's nothing else. Like everything else leaves, there's nothing else. You're thinking in that moment is so pure. And I'm sure in strength training, it's the same. Like once the muscles start burning, there's not a lot of other thinking going on, right? But you got to keep going. Um, and that's where we really learn so much about like who we truly are and we can separate ourselves from ourselves and get a bit of perspective. Yeah. Your step three is practice radical attention. I say this all the time. Like I think you can almost correlate success in life with your ability and your degree of deep focus and intentional thought, right? So you're saying practice radical attention. Tell me about that. Right. So I like I think there is a time to get into beta and to hustle and to perform. And when we are hustling and performing and that's doing our jobs, that's in the sales meeting, that's like whatever it is that you do, playing the music, performing on stage, like you've got to be all in. You can't have the distractions. And we live in an era of constant, unrelenting distraction. Like there's text messages coming in, there's social media, there's email, like there's a world of constant distraction where people are trying to get your attention so they can advertise to you and sell things to you, um, which is fine. It's part of a system. But uh, I think in order for us to perform at the highest possible level, 
we've got to control our attention and attention is the currency of our time. So uh, an example is I was racing many, many years ago, sort of near the end of my career and a very big uh, swim meet that I was at and I stood up on the blocks and it happened to qualify first for the final. So I was in the center of the pool and I stood up on the blocks to go and I looked left and there's a row of TV cameras and I looked right and there's a row of TV cameras and my teammates were there and the crowds were, the stands were full and like it was just the, too much going on, right? Okay. And it's like, and so you can imagine how well that race went when I'm looking around the building so, and all the other stuff going on, right? Right, because that could be two things. Because like, I know if I'm standing in that place, I'm like, fuck yeah, let's go. I'm like, oh, right? <laughs> yeah. go two different directions. Yeah, it, we, exactly. It can go in two different directions. Mine went, mine went in the wrong direction and I ended up coming fourth by like three one hundredths of a second to a buddy of mine. Oh, she still, bu still bugs me about that to this day. <laughs> um, and anyway, so... Uh, that that's a really a time when I mean the only thing that I could control in that moment, if you sort of visualize it, standing on the blocks looking down the pool, is the water in between those two lane ropes. Like that's my space. The TV yeah. cameras have nothing to do with my race. The stands right. have nothing to do with my race. My teammates have nothing to do with my race. My competitors have nothing to do with my race. And so if I was in that moment able to focus on what I'm supposed to do, swim four lengths of backstroke then I think it would have been a very, 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 very different outcome. And I think that's true for our lives, right? Like we arrive at work and we get inundated with email and or we're with our families and we're inundated by the news that's coming through on notifications on our phones. And so it's, in, I believe it's incredibly important for us to control our attention, direct it to the things that matter to us the most, eliminate the distractions when we need to, and that can make a huge difference in your life. So knowing what you know now, what do you do in that scenario? Uh, what you do in that scenario and what I probably should have done a little bit better, and I think this is sort of um, a good takeaway for like many of the things that I wish that I had done better in my life. Um, I definitely should have thought about it. Like the visualization, I think, would have solved that problem if I'd been visualizing the event and like even in the afternoon before I went, you know, between heats and finals, I could have gone home, gotten a nap, woken up, taken 10 minutes to visualize what's tonight going to look like. Yeah. Right. It's so the what, why, and how, what do I need to do? I need to swim fast, turn back. Right. And so, you know, yeah. Phelps, obviously. And, and so he apparently was the world's greatest visualizer. That was what his coach said. He's like, nobody can visualize like Michael. Right he, on. You know, every scenario, everything that could go right, everything that could go wrong. He had seen it in his, in his brain hundreds, if not thousands of times before it happened. And that's, that's an interesting testament to that statement. 100%. And if you watch Alex Honnold's documentary about the Dawn Wall and climbing uh, a free solo, which is uh, where he climbed 3,000 foot cliff in Yosemite National Park with no ropes or protection, but it's an incredible um, documentary. He says exactly the same thing. He had visualized and memorized every single move from the bottom of the mountain all the way to the top of the mountain on these cliffs as he ascends with no ropes, no protection, and visualized all of the things that could go wrong all the way up. So that if anything did go wrong, he knew exactly what to do. So I, looking back, didn't visualize the situation. I didn't plan for it. I just went through my normal warm-up, stood up on the blocks, like, hey, look, there's a lot of people here. Right? It's like, I, of course there were going to be people there. That's an easy, easy, easy thing to anticipate. But I didn't think about it. I didn't plan for it. And so as a result, I didn't get the result that, that I was thinking about. So thinking about the, that man you're saying climbing that mountain, one of the great quotes that resonates in my mind is comes from Paul Check. And, and Paul told, you know who Paul Check is? Yeah, I actually had Paul in a, as a guest on my podcast recently, so, yeah, so I'm he, very fortunate to have spoken to him. He does, he does rock stacking, so he, yeah. told me he was stacking rocks one time, and he reached down to pick up a rock, and he felt skin, and he, he uh, stood up, and, and it was a rattlesnake, and it, he grabbed a rattlesnake, and so he jumped back, and at that moment, he said, you know, I, I said thank you to the rattlesnake, because, and, and he says thank you to the rocks every day, he says, because they're a very great teacher, and a way to keep you focused and more conscious, right? So why are those things there that can cause you danger? It's forcing you to have such precision of thought and attention. So this gentleman climbing that 3,000 foot um, mountain ultimately, uh, absolute precision of thought, absolute precision of, of, of presence, right? Being there now, and I think that's maybe the greatest opportunity that exists for people out there who aren't because most of us live this mindless life because we live in this sheltered world where you really can't hurt yourself and you know everything becomes becomes autonomous but putting yourself in those scenarios intentionally where you're like okay hey, if i don't pay attention here this is going to go really really badly that's meditative right ultimately that's training that state and i think that's the idea of doing something every day that makes you uncomfortable there's uh there's something to be garnered there 100 percent. i love that idea of 
making yourself uncomfortable and also putting yourself in a situation where you need to bring your attention into the moment. I've traveled to 50 countries around the world. And one of the things I love about going to other countries, especially out of North America, is that there's no assumption that in North America, you're right, like there's guardrails on the roads, there's warning signs if you get near the edge of the cliff. Um, like literally the person who, like other people are responsible for your safety. Whereas if you go to South America, for example, and you do okay. another yeah, you're like, going off a cliff. If you go off a cliff, you're an idiot. Like yeah, literally yeah. you're an idiot. That's their thinking, right? Like don't drive so fast on that road, you're an idiot. You know, like if you are taking a selfie and step off the cliff, you're an idiot. That's the extent of, of their safety protocols. And so it, it, I like going to places like that because it brings your attention back into the moment. You do have to look where you're stepping. You do have to think about where you're getting your water. You do have to read the street signs. Like it brings you back into present moment awareness and this idea of being here now, which I think is uh, a key to happiness because so much of our time, uh, the monkey mind is spent thinking about the future, which does not exist. Uh, just think back to February, right? Like we all had great plans for 2020. None of them actually existed. Nope. And so the, because COVID-19 wiped out all of our plans for the year, but we adapted and humans are incredible at adapting. We've adapted to worse things in the past and COVID-19 will, will adapt to worse things in the future. And so what you're saying is exactly true. Like just be here now, think about the present moment, like bring your attention back into this, this moment. And that's, that unlocks so much possibility for all of us. One of my favorite questions that seems to resonate with all the things you're doing is how do you balance acceptance of self and um, I don't want to say contentment, but like a, a being appreciative for who you are with the pursuit of excellence? <sighs> um, that is like such a huge question. So what is radical self-acceptance? Let's think about that first. And I learned that term from a gentleman named Sadhguru in India. Um, and what radical means in that context is like full, complete acceptance of yourself for, for what it is. And the way that he describes it, which is interesting, is that you are who you are right now in this instant. This instant is the only instant that exists. It, therefore, anything that has happened is completely out of your control. There's, you, you have to accept it because there's nothing you can do about it. It happened. You are who you are. Therefore, if you accept that, and it doesn't mean that you have to be okay with it, if awful things have happened to you, it doesn't mean that they're right or that you need to um, accept the fact that someone may have abused you in the past or you know whatever happened. Like, but however, you in this instant are who you are as a result of everything that has happened. It is uncontrollable. It is immutable. You are in this instant who you are. Therefore, the only path forwards is to radically accept that. Like you are who you are in this moment. It's okay. This is where we're at. No big deal. You might be fit. You might be not fit. You might be happy. You might be not happy. You radically accept who you are. Then the only thing that happens once you get to that state is, okay, so now what? And so now what? So we can go back to thinking about the past, which is out of our control. Um, or we can be like, so now what? Now I'm at, what am I going to do? And that places response dash ability in your control, not responsibility, but like response dash ability, your ability to respond comes back into yourself at that point. And so that's what I've been really trying to work on a lot lately is just this radical self acceptance, you are who you are, and take more and more responsibility for myself and my future, my attitude, my positivity. And it's a struggle. I don't, uh, don't pretend like this is an easy thing to do. Um, and I actually think that that unlocks the potential to achieve excellence because I, I don't see those as being separate things. I actually see radical self-acceptance as essential to world-class training. So for example, I was out for a bike ride with some of my friends recently. They're fitter than I am right now, which is super annoying because it hasn't always been the case, but it is what it is. Um, they've had more time during COVID than I have, and that just annoys me. Um, and we're out there and hammering and long time, and they're pushing the pace, and I'm suffering like crazy. And my internal chatter was so negative it's like just angry and upset and frustrated because i'm hyper competitive as you may have noticed and um i got back and i was like you know, i was angry at my buddies they got different jobs than i have and they're like not working as hard as i am in COVID to pivot and to create a digital business and all these sorts of things. Ride without changing your state yeah like i was just and i got home and i was like uh you know that's actually all me yeah. Right. So it's like, there's nothing wrong with those guys. They're loving their life. They're doing exactly what they're taking advantage of the opportunity that they have at the moment. And I was like, no, nah, that was a hundred percent me. Yeah. And so, um, 
and it's interesting, I was not able to change it during the ride itself. It actually took me coming home, settling down, breathing, getting a bite to eat, sitting in the lake by myself, and then realizing, yeah, no, that's 100% on me. Um, and I love that because it makes me in control of my life. It makes me con in control of my happiness. And I've been a lot better, a lot nicer on these rides ever since and doing secret training to catch up, which I'm not telling anyone about. That's, right. so. that's, part, of it, that's yeah. part of the drive, right? Yeah, it is. But that's the idea. That's the balance between excellence and acceptance. I think the only way to get to excellence is by accepting. And once you accept where you are, it is what it is. It's out of your control. Love yourself no matter what. Then all of a sudden, so now what? Well, now I'm going to train more. There still has to be a degree, a degree of discontentment, doesn't there, to pursue excellence? Or is it – so obviously there's, there's a pursuit of, of, of pleasure versus the avoidance of pain. So does there have to be a degree of discontentment with where you are, with the status quo, to pursue excellence? Or is that just maybe the pursuit of excellence comes from um, just wanting to fulfill my dharma, my greatest self? Like wh where are all – I mean, where's your thought on that? that you know? Yeah, my thoughts on that are excellence is whatever it, it is for you. Right. And so for me, I love to push the limits. Like I'm happy when I'm training two, three hours a day. I'm really happy when I'm on the top of a mountain. I'm really happy when I'm in the ocean surrounded that's by sharks. Accident, though, right? that's, that's building the brain chemistry with that stuff. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Like I even remember when I was five years old at the Montreal Olympics and like watching track and field and being fascinated by it and like demanding that my mom and dad take me into swimming, even though they didn't have tickets. Oh, wow. um, <clears throat> but it's kind of wild. Right. And even when I was a swimmer, I was like very quickly driven to, and I look at my daughter, like I just see her drive is crazy. Um, so that's just, that's just me. But I also have infinite respect for the fact that I've got friends who like are just really, really happy being with and spending time with their kids. And that's something that I aspire to, right? Like I wish that I could spend more time with my, and be more present with my children. That's something I'd like to be better at as a dad. Um, and so whatever it is, whatever excellence means to you, if it happens to be pushing limits in sports, fantastic. If it happens to be being a world-class scientist, wonderful. Um, if it happens to be being the coach for your kid's minor league hockey team and with no specific objective other than the kids having a great time, that is also wonderful. It could also be being a great partner and spouse, which takes an enormous amount of, of work and attention and energy and deliberate, um, deliberate effort. So I really don't care what it is. Like excellence to me is such a massive range, almost like, you know, the child in the, the cancer ward going to the washroom by themselves all the way through to an Olympic athlete. Like excellence to me has that range of experiences. And much like we want to radically accept ourselves, I also think that that enables you to stop comparing yourself to others, right? And it's like, um, therefore, we don't really care what anyone else's excellence is. We're all just trying to live a great life. And if you want to help spend time with your kids, knock yourself out. I'm going for a run because that's what I feel like doing. I don't judge you for not coming on the run with me and you know, and I'm gonna try not to judge myself for going on a run and not spending my time with my kids, right? So it all just sort of fits yeah. into this relentless positivity and uplifting each other. And it's not easy, like I, I struggle with it and I don't think that it's, um, yeah, it's not easy. I struggle with it and sure. every day I'm trying to work on trying to be better in that way. Right, I feel it's a dynamic balance, right? So. What you value in, in this day and age, in this exact moment, may be different than what you value six months from now, may be different than what you valued six months ago. So uh, establishing your values and your priorities is a really important way to start making decisions and then ultimately not feeling guilty about it, right? So if in this exact moment you want you value this, your physical health, then that's, why would you, why would anyone judge you? Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. And like the other thing that you mentioned, which is, su is super important is that this evolves over time. And what you value right now might not be what you value next year, right? Like actually when we jumped on this call, you're like, you're doing any endurance training right now. It's like, no, I'm just sort of exercising. Like I did Ironman last year, but not specifically training for Ironman this year. I'm just trying to be fitter in general. And I'm not too um, concerned about, about that. And if you said 10 years ago, literally, if you had said to me 10 years ago right now, Greg, you're going to be a four-time best-selling author. I would have laughed at you. Like I had no concept of writing a book. But then I went and commentated the Olympics and someone said, can you write a book about the Olympics? And I was like, sure, it'd be great to write a book. And then that led to three others. Um, and so now I'm, an, now I'm an author. Like, it's crazy. Like, we don't know where we're going to be. We have no clue. And so that, again, gets back to like living in the moment and adapting and being, you know, what you want to do right now is fine. And it might not be what you were doing before. And it might not be what you're doing in the future. But right now, let's just be in the moment. Let's be present. Let's be happy. Let's do the things that make us make us uh, joyful, bring us bliss and, and uh, you know, just make our lives better. So for myself and for the audience, 
aspiring to live um, a life of excellence, perform at the highest level, is there anything that's on your radar right now that um, we haven't talked about that you would be like, hey, this is really exciting um, science or really exciting data, really exciting tech that exists in the future to allow us to push human performance further? Yeah, one of the things I'm really interested in right now is um, personalized medicine. I don't think we're there yet, but it's just starting. Like we're just starting to get a, enough of an understanding of our DNA and our genome to be able to, excuse me, make some decisions about um, how our phenotype expresses itself. So our genotype is a DNA code. Phenotype is how that expresses itself in terms of like your skin or your muscles or, or whatever. And so the genetic testing has got me really fascinated right now. I don't think we're anywhere close to being able to say like, you should eat these foods based upon your genetics. Like I, I definitely don't think those, um, that's, that's where we're at. But I think that that's a very fascinating area in the future. Um, I recently did my genome, had my genome sequenced and then did very comprehensive blood work and where my genome was um, consistent with blood work that I didn't think was very good, that's where I took action. So I had bad genetics in some cases, but my blood work was totally fine, in which case I ignored that problem. But I have bad genetics for omega-3 fatty acid absorption, for example. So now I take four times the recommended dose of fatty acids and my fatty acid levels have normalized. Uh, so that was really, really interesting. You're an organic acid test as well to see some of the metabolic pathways. Um, I haven't done that one yet. I'm just sort of doing the, the introductory okay. basics yeah. so far, but yeah. that's so, been fascinating. Like you, I've seen, you know, so for many years I would do my blood and I would see very particular markers keep showing up again and again and again. Then I did my DNA probably four or five years ago and those markers were there in my DNA too. And I was like, okay, this stuff is real. And it's got a relatively good indication with a very small number of SNPs. Yeah. Uh, that what they do because obviously there's there's hundreds of thousands of potential um, permutations but the ones that they feel like they have a good handle on i think are actually relatively accurate surprisingly because i was actually surprised too with how accurate they are because it seems like a lot of them are uh, contradictory to each other right mm -hmm. so I say this and some say that and like how do you know where it is but if it manifests in the blood and the organic acid which is obviously a urine analysis uh, it seems to have merit so i try to do it about every three to six months as far as the blood and, and organic acid tests and just see based on these changes I've made dietarily and, and supplementally, you know, how does it affect? And is there something else that shows up that maybe correlates to the DNA as well? So it's always kind of going back and, you know, seeing what's happening to the DNA. There's some, there's some really bright people out there. I'm not sure how deep you're into that DNA world, but there's some really bright people out there who are doing some really high level stuff when it comes to DNA. Again, we're certainly at, at in, you know, the, the baby years, the formative years, but uh, it's, it's, mind-blowing what is possible yeah we're definitely at the model t ford uh level of all of this stuff so like everyone listening like just be very careful there's a lot of stuff being marketed online yeah it's very it's probably like i said i'm, I'm hyper skeptical of most of it um that's why i did the genetics that's why i looked at the SNPs. that's why i looked at those related to my blood work and there's a few people around that, that can do that sort of work um but yeah take it easy like this is this isn't the panacea yet uh, but I definitely think it's in 50 years from now, this will be absolutely dialed in and maybe not even 50 years from now, like maybe 20 years from now, this will be totally yeah. dialed in and a part of all of our lives for sure. Yeah. It's the type of thing where you can kind of look and see what's going to give me the greatest bang for my buck. If I see I have a genetic limitation here, this pathway is not, it, it's uh, challenged or we'll support that type of training. And all of a sudden you need to see this tremendous bump. Whereas if you went after something that's already a strength for you genetically, it may not have the same type of advantage. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating. Greg, tell everyone where you can get your book and where they can find more about you. Sure. Uh, so my website's www.drgregwells.com. All my social media are at Dr. Greg Wells. The book is Rest, Refocus, Recharge. It's on Amazon. If you wanted to pick it up, I would be honored and privileged because clearly we have not sold that many books since every bookstore in the world closed for the last three months. Yeah. So if you want to pick it up via Amazon, that would be epic and I'd be infinitely grateful. And feel free to connect with me online. I will answer um, everyone's questions. I'm really, I put a lot of effort into like actually answering all the DMs that come in from these shows. So please feel free to ping me and I'd be honored to connect with all of you. Absolutely. When you read the book, make sure you leave them a review because that's ultimately what drives those sales. When people want to know your real opinions and ultimately I think it would help you as well. Like, Hey, you know, I'm sure it's an incredible, uh, incredible book as I'm going to be diving into super bodies because that sounds like it's talking my language. So yeah. I look forward to reading that Dr. Greg Wells. I really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Really honored and privileged. A great chat. That was so much fun. Thank you. And that's a wrap, ladies and gents. Thank you so much for tuning into the Must Intelligence Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ben Pekulski. We frame this podcast 
around the six pillars of a lean, healthy, muscular body. And learning how to breathe is a big, big part of it. Learning how to manage your stress is massive to not only having a high-performing mind, but a high-performing body, and ultimately, maybe uh, removing stress and anxiety, maybe removing uh, stress eating, overeating, binge eating, um, depression, poor sleep, all these little things that tend to add up over time can sometimes begin to be overcome by learning to control your physiology, right? Learn to control your physiology. Your physiology massively impacts your psychology. So hopefully you guys have got some value from this podcast. If you did, get at least one golden nugget. I'd appreciate a share. I'd appreciate a review on iTunes because ultimately iTunes uh, ratings drives this podcast. So the higher we place, the higher we rank on the iTunes rankings, the better guests we can get, the honestly better information we can get for you guys and for us so we can all thrive. I altruistically share this information with you uh, to help us all live the greatest life we can. So hopefully if you love this podcast, I'd appreciate a share, I'd appreciate a review, and don't forget to subscribe. We have more great stuff coming at you next week. Cheers, guys. Don't forget to pick up Masszymes from Bioptimizers. Use the code MUSCLE10 at masszymes.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.